Welcome to What They Don't Tell You About Being a Survivor, a podcast that builds community amongst those affected by trauma with a purpose to promote healing and social change. As a reminder, this show is for mature audiences and the conversation might be triggering and or difficult for some to hear. Please respect and listen to your own body as you listen to what is shared. If you need to pause an episode or even stop an episode, There is no shame in that. We acknowledge that those listening will hear personal journeys that are like their own. There are resources listed on our homepage if you want to talk with someone. Please know there is help. There are people who care. You are not in this alone. We thrive in diversity, and as such, there will be people who have different views than you do, and that's a good thing. The world would be an awful place if we were all identical. There is no judgment in this space. As always, I am your co-host, Laura, and I would like to introduce our host for this episode, Julia. Julia, could you please introduce yourself and some of your experience? Sure. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me on this episode. I'm Julia Reichenberger. I'm from the University of Salzburg, which is in Austria and I am a postdoc at the university, especially in the Eating Behavior Laboratory. And during my PhD, I was focused on negative and positive evaluations, so fear of evaluations. And during my postdoc, I specialized on eating behavior and especially stress eating and emotional eating. That sounds really fascinating work. Thanks. Um, So maybe I'll start right into the field of eating behavior if you want me to. Sounds perfect. Right, so um, we all have human needs. You know that we need to sleep, we need to breathe, we need to drink and also eat. So eating is a basic human need that we need in order to grow, in order to sustain life. And well, in the past, most of the time we ate because of physiological needs. So we had an energy deficit and needed to eat something in order to have an energy balance again. And nowadays we don't only need because of physiological needs. We have other factors that influence our eating behaviors, other factors than hunger and survival. And when you think about Christmas, which is just right around the corner, or just happened or other special occasions most of the time we eat more than we actually want it we are with with our loved ones we have social company and then we eat more than we wanted or also because we have food all available it was standing around so instead of hunger we eat because of availability we eat because of special occasions Sometimes we also eat because of time pressure. Again, when you think about a stressful day, at the end of the day, you might not cook a fresh meal. You might either stop at a fast food restaurant and get a burger, or there might also be people who, because of stress, don't eat anything, maybe they don't have any time to eat anymore. So there are a lot of different factors that actually influence our eating behavior. And one of them might also be emotions. Emotional eating is my main focus. And it's basically defined as having negative emotions and in response to those you eat or have a, first you have a craving and strong desire to eat something. And in turn, you eat something. And that might most of the time be negative emotions. Like when you're sad, when you're angry, when you're anxious, but it could also be positive emotions when you're happy. So this is emotional eating I'm going to talk about in this episode. And yeah, again, Laura, feel free to ask any questions in case you want, want to know something. Okay. Um, so emotional eating can be more like a general thing. So when you feel in it, when you are in a negative state, that might make you eat something. It could also be specific emotions that make you eat something. For example, when you're sad or when you're bored or when you're anxious. 
And we have a question there actually that assesses that different aspects. I'm going to talk about that later. I first want to give you some, some explanations about emotional eating. So there are different theories why emotional eating might actually occur. There is one theory that says that, um, what that is called an effect regulation theory saying that when you are in a negative state and you eat something, you might actually get a relief from that negative emotion and you learn that from time to time. So when, when you did that once, the next time you are in a negative state, you might again eat something because you know that that makes, makes you feel better and makes you feel positive in the end. Another theory would actually be that most of us are, are kind of restricting their food intake. So again, we have food all around everywhere, nearly 24 seven. So we kind of need to restrict ourselves in order not to eat all the time, delicious and high caloric foods. And whenever we have emotions, maybe negative or positive, that needs all our self control. So we need to focus on that emotion. We need self control in order to cope with that emotion. And we don't have any self control anymore for restricting our food intake. So the theory actually says when we are in a negative emotional state, we eat something because we can't control our restriction anymore. We can't control dietary restraint anymore. So these are the theories why emotional eating might occur. And now I want to yeah, briefly talk about the research we do in our laboratory. So we have different methodologies we use for assessing emotional eating. We, in, in 2018, we developed two different questionnaires, one for stress eating and one for emotional eating, because we think there is a difference. And well, we actually find that difference. We see that there is pure stress eating and there is pure emotional eating. And we also see differences with regard to the emotion itself. So we see that there is um, sadness eating. There's also anger eating, anxious, anxious eating, and also happy eating. And what we actually see is that when we ask people how do you eat when you are sad? Most of the people say that they eat more than usual. When we ask them, how do you eat when you're angry? They say they eat less than usual. And also when we ask them about how they eat when they are anxious, they say that actually they eat less than usual. And when you think about that, that actually makes sense. When you're sad, all of the movies actually tell you, grab some ice cream, grab some cookie, and you might feel better, you, you can comfort yourself with eating. Whereas when you're angry, or when you're, when you're anxious, you might actually need all of your energy in order to either kind of like fight with the person when you're angry or um, run away when you're anxious. So anger and, and anxiety actually have high arousal in your body, you feel tense, you feel um, yeah, kind of in a, in a high arousal state, you might feel your heartbeat. And of course, in such a situation, you don't want to eat something, you actually refrain from eating and do anything else. And the last aspect the happiness eating, we also see that people eat because when they are happy. And in general, we see that on average, people have an unflu uninfluenced eating behavior in response to happiness. However, there are some people who eat more when they are happy. And these are actually the ones that, who have a healthier BMI because um, happiness eating seems to be something that's quite adaptive. And we also asked patients with eating disorders how they react in such situations. And we see that um, especially people with restrictive anorexia nervosa. So people who restrict their eating behavior to a very high, um, yeah, 
<laughs> quite strongly restrict their eating behavior, which might even be threatening for their lives, they actually eat more when they are happy because that in that situation might give them some self-caring and allow them to, to eat something. Whereas people with um, bulimia nervosa or also binge eating disorder, so people who suffer from regular binge eating attacks, they, they, f they eat more when they are in negative emotional states. They eat more when they, when they are sad, when they are anxious, when they are angry. And apart from that research with the questionnaires, we also do research in the natural setting of the people. So we equip them with our smartphone apps and ask them several times a day about their negative emotions, but also about their eating behavior. And they report on that as they go on with their daily routines and their, their daily life. And what we see is that people actually report higher craving when they are in negative emotional states, especially those who would consider themselves as emotional eater. Apart from these two methodologies, we also use laboratory studies, which is also where we have that kind of eating behavior laboratory where participants come into our laboratory and take part in an experiment. For example, we had one study where participants were instructed to think about a negative situation in the last few weeks. For example, having a yeah, discussion with your boyfriend or you failed through an exam. And we wanted them to reimagine that situation in the laboratory and then ask them, how much would you like to eat something right now? How, much, how strong is your desire to eat something right now? And we also gave them an, a neutral situation, like bringing a, a letter to the post. And again, ask them, how much would you like to eat something right now? And what we see is that people, again, who have a high emotional eating trait, or who would consider themselves as being emotional eaters, actually had a higher desire to eat during the negative situation compared to the neutral one. So we also see that emotional eating in the laboratory. Um, so this is basically what we do in our research. Laura, do we have any questions so far? Yeah, thank you so much for, I mean, it's really fascinating. And I honestly don't think I've ever heard anyone share about like eating labs and different methodologies and theories in eating and there's so much focus on negative emotions in eating i've never heard anyone talk about happiness eating before which is just fascinating and so people that tend to eat when they're happier tend to make more healthier food choices then You're, you're completely right. So happiness eating is a rather new construct. I think it, yeah, the first studies are from 2013, so it's not that old. And happiness eating seems to be more like a healthy choice, but it also can be that you eat something yeah, delicious, high caloric, high in, sugar, high in fat or high in sugar. Um, However, you don't use it as a kind of way to cope with that emotion. You don't use it in a way to regulate them. You rather eat maybe because you are in company, because you're with others and you're feeling good and you don't blame yourself about having that cookie. You actually enjoy it during these times. And then it's more functional than the other way around when you, when you eat something because you're in a negative state and you use it as a way to regulate your emotion and that helps you and you might feel better in the short term. However, long term, you might blame yourself for having that cookie and for not resisting. Yeah. And I absolutely love how you pointed out about how movies show us that, you know, like when you're sad, you go for the ice cream. Um, which is very true, and I don't know how it is in Austria, but like a lot of portions of the United States, 
it's easier to get junk food and unhealthy food um, than it is to get fresh food. Mm -hmm. Is that similar to where you are too, or? I mean, the unhealthy food is something you can order 24 seven or you can get 24 seven. And um, I was quite fascinated when, when I was in America and you have that insomnia cookies or, or other um, or other chains where you can order your cookies during the night. And of course, getting something fresh is on the one hand more expensive most of the time. So you get a lot more calories by, by eating chocolate or anything else compared to, to eating salad. So you get more calories for less price. And well, ordering fast food, as you said, is much easier compared to healthy food choices. Yeah. Yeah. You don't exactly see like salad and restaurants open at like 2 AM to deliver. Right. And also, if you think about the, the situation I depicted before, like when you think back on Christmas, um, these are the situations where you eat unhealthy, high caloric foods. You don't, you don't imagine yourself eating salad on Christmas. I think there are other things you might eat. And you also have these things available all the time. You have the cookies standing around. And so normally, when we think about emotional eating, it's about high sugar, high fat, and high caloric foods. These are the ones that, that kind of comfort us. These are the ones that give us a good emotion. And so what is it about those food that comfort us? Because, you know, like we hear about soul food and different comfort foods, and they tend to be like very sweet, very salty or very oily? Mm. Well, on the one hand, it does something with your brain. It kind of releases um, hormones that uh, makes you feel good. On the other hand, we also have specific connections to these, these foods. So even in childhood, all of us might have a specific food they eat when they are sad or they get when, when yeah, when they when they feel sad or angry. And we kind of continue that we combine that and we yeah, learn that positive to combine that positive emotion with that specific food. That's the one that reminds us on the past. That's the one that reminds us on, on comfort and warm, warm feelings. That makes sense. And speaking of like childhood and families, um, do you find that emotional eating, like if your parents were emotional eaters, that the children are more likely to be emotional eaters? Does that tend to run in families? Mm, I don't know about any studies on that, but I think that of course you have your parents as a role model and you see how they behave when they are in emotional states and you learn how to cope with emotions by your parents. They have to validate when validate your emotions when you when you feel sad they also have to tell you what to do if they avoid negative emotions and don't want to talk about them or regulate them with food of course that's something that does something to yourself and gives you yeah that kind of picture of what you should do sure like a learned coping mechanism through negative behaviors, I guess. So maybe because um, your blog is about what the podcast is about trauma, maybe let's also look at the relationship between trauma and emotional eating, if that's okay for you. That would be amazing. So I actually had to look into the literature myself, but um, because I'm not an expert on that, but there is quite some research on the relationship between childhood trauma and emotional eating. And there's quite consistent research that 
childhood sexual abuse, but also physical abuse or emotional abuse relates to emotional eating in adulthood. So all of these traumas have been considered to be non-specific risk factors for the development of eating disorders in later life. And there are different reasons why this might be the case. Different mechanisms have been researched. So the most consistent one or consistently identified one is that childhood trauma might relate to emotion dysregulation. So emotion regulation means that people are able to identify and also understand and manage emotional states. And the emotion regulation hypothesis states that individuals who have experienced trauma may be more prone to ongoing difficulties with emotion regulation and which can then lead to disordered eating as a way to regulate these negative emotions. And so there might be some intermediate factors between childhood trauma and emotional eating in later life. And emotion dysregulation might be one of that. There might also be aspects like depression, <clears throat> where people with childhood trauma might develop a, dep a depression in later life and then develop emotional eating. Or it might also be dissociation has also been mentioned as an important mediator, saying that um, yeah, people kind of disconnect from, from their surrounding, from their emotions and their cognitive states. And there is also some interesting qualitative work. So there's a research study saying that, um, well, well, the experimenters had a focus group with um, female veterans who changed their eating behavior in response to stress, also used food to cope with stress. And they actually asked them, why, why do they think that um, they have disordered eating or emotional eating? And they actually identified three different reasons. One of them was that trauma may be associated with disordered eating in relation to negative affect maladaptive thoughts. So individuals with trauma may experience some kind of lower self-esteem or may use disordered eating as a punishment or because of emotional detachment. A second explanation was that it could provide a short-term, however, not long-term relief from the negative effect. So that is again, well, that kind of theory that disordered eating and also emotional eating can be used to regulate emotions. And the third aspect was that disordered eating could also provide a mechanism to avoid unwanted attention from potential or also past perpetrators of trauma. So by changing your shape or weight, either in the direction of gaining, but also in the direction of losing weight, you might uh, kind of prevent future traumas. So that has also been described by the female veterans as an important reason why they engage in disordered and of emotional eating. And quite interestingly, um, people with an eating disorder have also higher risk of um, or higher percentage of experienced trauma. So research says that um, roughly 80% of individuals with an eating disorder also report a trauma exposure. And this is why eating disorder samples actually have higher um, higher rates of childhood sexual abuse, but also physical abuse compared to non-clinical samples. And there might be also some variables that might be important in there, like these people may experience bodily shame, also self-shame, self-blame and a negative self-image. So, and apart from um childhood trauma and emotional eating of course also yeah trauma experiences in, in adulthood relate to the development of eating disorders and there's also research saying that um <clears throat> emotional eating is higher 
in individuals with um, PTSD, with post-traumatic stress disorder, compared to participants without that. And emotional eating might even increase with higher PTSD symptom severity. So the more symptoms, the more emotional eating. And that finding has also been replicated in veterans, but also seems quite consistent in the previous literature. Well, thank you for looking into that and sharing all that. And I got to say that um, study with the female veterans is really interesting, especially like what you were sharing with uh, PTSD and the higher the symptoms of the PTSD, the higher the eating disorder. And um, you had shared um, briefly about eating is almost like a self-punishment kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, that's fascinating. Um, just because like after people experience trauma, you know, we don't talk very much about self-punishment and what that is and what it looks like. And that's interesting to hear that eating can be a form of self-punishment. Yeah, I mean, there are different things that you can use as self-punishment, of course. And um, so I think eating on the one hand can comfort you, but on the, on the other hand can also punish you. That's, that's kind of a <laughs> controversial. Um, it is, and it seems like, you know, we hear more and more that we need to have a healthy relationship with our food, but nobody really talks about how to have a healthy relationship with your food. And, you know, it's just coming to mind as, you know, hearing you talk about your research and others' research, just, yeah. Yeah, thanks for, for pointing that out. I think um, I think it's it's not that simple, honestly, to um, have the the way to eat healthy. Um, I think diets have been the for for years have been the the most prominent one. However, also the the ones that we know that don't work. So when you restrict your food intake and try to eat healthy foods instead of unhealthy foods that might work for a short period of time however not long term and you might regain your weight that you've lost and um, there are some some uh, kind of popular ones these days like interval fasting and also more how do you say it? Well, acceptant based ones like uh, mindful eating, which teaches you how to, how to keep yourself aware of what you're eating and how to, well, kind of listen to what your body needs, listen to your inner signals. If it tells you that you're hungry and, um, kind of follow that specific need your body tells you. I think these are the, the, yeah, nowadays, these are the ones that are most promising, I think. And does your lab get into helping people develop that, like, healthy eating habits and healthy relationship with their food? Um, we had one study during COVID, COVID, <laughs> COVID. Um, which um, was from one of my colleagues. She had a smartphone app programmed with um, self-kindness, so being kind to yourself and um, kind of like self-compassion, um, which means that you have 
a sense for yourself as being part of a broader community, being being part of yeah, all of that. And she actually did that during COVID to provide the people with the smartphone app and they did some some exercises each day, like meditation and also breathing exercises. And she found that people actually reduced their emotional eating and their stress eating over that period. And so it might help people to, at least in our study for, for um, short time, to engage in more healthy eating. Yeah, that, that'd be interesting to read that research as well. And then um, just going back quickly to the trauma and the eating, I think it's worth just highlighting what you had shared about um, people gaining or losing weight, basically trying to change the shape of their body to avoid that trauma from happening again. I know I mm -hmm. saw a meme one time that was like, eat more cake and reduce being kidnapped or something like that. So there's actually like signs and jokes and stuff that you see out there about, hey, gain weight so you don't get assaulted. Mm -hmm. Well, it's sad that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, was sad to hear that, that people would have to take that path and have to lose weight in order to prevent that to happen. Um, it is, and I think it just goes into, like, the heart of this podcast is that we just don't talk about the effects of trauma <clears throat> and living after a traumatic experience. And, you know, just the way it, you change how you view yourself and how you see yourself, which brings me up to um, body dysmorphia, if I'm correct on that term. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Or do you have experience with that on how people perceive their bodies differently than they actually are? and how that affects their eating? I don't have any any experience on body dysmorphic disorder. Um, I mean, body image itself is always an important aspect also in eating disorders, how you perceive yourself and how you how you kind of estimate your, your size and, and your weight. And most of the time, we are not very good at that. So even control participants who don't have traumatic experiences are not good in in estimating their their size, for example. And I do think that especially with regard to trauma, as I said, there is this this aspect of um, yeah, kind of self blame and also body shame that might be very important with that regard. Well, thank you for sharing that. Was there anything else that you were hoping to share? Um, let me think. I think on the one hand, I'd also like to say something about the biological mechanism, because um, I talked about these mediating factors and what might explain why, why people with childhood trauma develop emotional eating in later life. There's also um, a kind of a biological explanation because people with uh, childhood trauma may have actually a reversed stress response. So in humans, the HPA axis is responsible for stress responses. So when we get in front of a stressor, this axis is activated and we have the release of hormones and that's a bodily system that prepares us to either fight or flight in the face of that. And normally we have a, an, an activation of that axis when we are in, in the face of that. And instead of that hyperactivation, in people with childhood trauma, they might actually have a hypoactivation 
and does have rather atypical symptoms instead of an decreased appetite they might have actually an increased appetite so normally the hpa axis would suppress our appetite i think again in the face of that we need to either fight or flight we need all of our energy to focus on that on that stressor and in these people um the axis might be reversed so they have actually increased appetite and thus also weight gain and thus potentially also emotional eating and so what you asked about the yeah kind of ways to eat healthy um i think also because of the important aspect of the emotion regulation of what well, the emotion regulation function of eating i think for well, well, my best guess would be to use emotion regulation and train that yeah get some skills and thereby learn how to cope with your emotions in a functional way instead of eating so there are yeah quite some different ways you can you can cope with your emotions you can either have this functional ways like eating or so drinking alcohol and you can also have functional ways like reappraising situations think again about having a fight with your boyfriend for example um or think about um a friend of yours who does not show show up for a meeting you can think of her as well not being a good friend maybe she does not want to have something to do with you anymore or she might not like you anymore and when you think in that way you might actually have a negative emotion like feeling sad or maybe also being angry you can also think about her um maybe she had an accident or maybe something else happened to her why she cannot show up that would also make you make you feel negative and yeah but kind of give you feelings of anxiousness and another ways about to think about that would also be to think that maybe she could not make it maybe she forgot about it and that might or might not make you make it may give you negative emotions however there are different ways to think about that situation you can also think about her being well kind of being like that she always forgets about it and that's part of her personality and it's maybe you can also laugh about it because she's always like that so you have different ways to appraise a situation and appraising that in a more positive way or more neutral way might help you to regulate the emotions you would normally have you can also learn acceptance based strategies and trying to accept the emotion it's okay that you, she's there or that you are it's okay to be sad from time to time and you can also learn adaptive ways to comfort yourself comfort yourself like taking a bath or listening to some music and i think that learning about emotions learning about how to identify them how do you feel them in your body what are your cognitions when you when you have that emotion what do you normally do when you have that emotion and how can you functionally cope with that emotion i think that's the most important thing to learn well thank you so much for sharing that i i really appreciate hearing that and thank you i'm sure a lot of listeners are also going to benefit from hearing that Well, is there anything else that you were hoping to cover or mm, No, I think I've covered everything I wanted and I hope as you said that it might help some people to yeah, cope with their emotional eating. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it will. It's not a topic that we openly talk about and I really appreciate 
you sharing your expertise and your research and others research that you're familiar with just getting that out there because you know eating is something that you know we don't always notice that a loved one has a unhealthy relationship with their food or maybe uh, ourselves even we don't realize that we have an unhealthy relationship or understanding why we have that unhealthy relationship and just touching on trauma and especially like children and veterans and hearing that you know like we're not alone if you're having an unhealthy relationship with your food that's definitely not the only one and there's services out there and there's ways to cope with that so thank you for touching on all of that and is there any advice you'd like to oh go ahead no, thanks again for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, is there any advice you'd like to give anyone that you haven't already? Mm, I think maybe just sum summarizing that I would encourage everyone to learn about their emotions and learn how to deal with them in a functional way. Well said. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Julia.